Hello and welcome. We ended uh, last uh, video talking about um, morality, uh, the difference between the amiable virtues and the mundane virtues. Uh, so now let's apply that and go back to uh, our question uh, involving this economic society that we live in. Uh, and why are some forms of competition accepted and others not? Let's take, uh, for example, discrimination. Discrimination usually has a negative connotation to it. And some forms of discrimination are, in fact, illegal. You cannot discriminate on the basis of uh, gender or sex or race, um, sexual orientation, things like that. But other ways you can discriminate on. Uh, for example, uh, you can discriminate uh, to a limited extent based on age. Uh, some restaurants will offer early bird sales. Some, uh, a lot of places do senior citizen discounts, um, AARP, things like that. Some places do military discounts. Or if you work for the county or the city, uh, you can get discounts, things like that. Student discounts are, are everywhere. Lots of restaurants here in Frederick, Maryland do uh, student discounts. So there are some forms of discrimination that are accepted and some forms that are not. Um, you know, actually, some more examples of discrimination, the dating market. Uh, we do not give everybody who uh, wants to date us an equal opportunity. We have the right to say, no, I don't want to date you. No, I don't want uh, to go out with you. Things like that. That is a form of discrimination. So why some forms are acceptable and why some forms are not depends a lot on the world in which we live. Uh, legislation and laws, laws being uh, different from just legislation, uh, help shape uh, what we call the rules of the game. Uh, also important facts, uh, uh, also important factors are uh, customs, uh, certain kinds of behavior uh, are acceptable, things like that. All these shape what we call the rules of the game. Uh, your book uh, will refer to them mostly uh, as legislation, orders that come down from Congress or Annapolis or even the county seat. Um, but they're more than just regulations. Uh, these laws, these legislation, these uh, customs help form uh, our mundane and amiable virtues. Uh, we did not talk a lot about uh, specific situations where mundane and where amiable fit in because there's a lot of loose, vague, and indeterminate uh, factors that go into play. What is proper behavior is very hard to pin down. There tends to be a range here, and that range is defined by the factors that we were just talking about, laws, legislation, customs. Um, there are other ways that uh, help shape um, our behavior. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the science of the legislator, the uh, proper uh, actions of the legislator uh, and the government, things like that. In our system, the system of the United States of America and most of the world, we have uh, a system that includes a lot of rules regarding private property rights, uh, how much control we have over our property, who actually owns property. Uh, we tend to have the freedom to exchange. Uh, basically, as long as you're not violating certain rules, you can uh, trade with one another. And we also have... Uh, an extensive system of negative rights. Negative meaning uh, thou shalt not as opposed to thou shall. So uh, an example, the freedom of speech does not tell us what to say. Uh, it just says that government cannot stop us from saying things outside a few very rare, uh, very uh, hard to get over exceptions. Um, so things like that. Other systems do not necessarily have these rules or don't have them to the same extent. Uh, the, of course, famous example is the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had no private property or very, very, very little, and the government owned most things. 
China uh, right now has liberalized. They have uh, opened up uh, private property, but still for the most part, the government owns most things. And there uh, aren't as many negative rights uh, that we enjoy here today. No system can be analyzed without understanding these rules. And analyzing our these rules, analyzing these rules of the game will be a huge part of this class. Later on, I have an entire lecture dedicated to uh, a field of study called public choice, which uh, is looking at how government uh, interacts with the marketplace uh, and, and other non-market decision-making uh, tools. I also have a special lecture planned on law and economics. We're going to uh, examine how uh, law is influenced by uh, a lot of this uh, behavior and the things that we're looking at. So institutions are going to play an important part uh, of the game because you need to understand the rules of the game before they can get played. So one of the rules that we have is private property. Private property implies that um, one has control over how that property is used or not used. Part of the uh, point of private property is you can say no. Um, so since resources are scarce, how we use our property implies that we cannot um, use it in other ways. So this necessarily means that there are trade-offs. And one of the ways that we illustrate these trade-offs are like what we have here and what we call a production possibilities frontier or PPF for short. Uh, the PPF is just a uh, it's just an example of the trade-off uh, for producing two goods. Uh, we can make this multi-dimensional, we can play around with this in many ways, but the logic stays the same. So for our purposes we're going to keep it nice and simple. So consider a world where we have two resources or two uh, goods we want to try and produce healthcare and education uh, some amount of healthcare will require uh, resources it's as simple as that and in the world we live in we only have so many resources at our disposal so we can spend all of our resources producing healthcare like point a here we can use all of our resources producing education, point F here, or some combination thereof, which is the curve point here. Uh, points B, C, and D all represent some uh, allocation of resources that gives us some health care and some education. Um, so all that we have here is just the trade-off between health care and education. If we want to uh, produce go from producing, uh, say, uh, all of our resources towards healthcare, and we want some education, we need to give up a little healthcare uh, to get education, moving from point A to point B. If we want to uh, gain a little bit more, we need to give up more resources, and we move from point B to C, D to F, or C to D, D to F, etc. Uh, one thing I want to point out with this uh, graph that your book will go into a lot more detail on is this idea of diminishing marginal returns. The idea is the more resources you commit to producing a particular good, the less uh, output those uh, resources on the margin will produce. You can see that pretty clearly here from point A to point B. We give up a little bit of healthcare and we get a lot of education. However, by the time we get to point D to F here, we have to give up a lot of healthcare to get a very tiny bit of education. As we devote more resources uh, from healthcare towards education, each additional resource produces less output. That is why the PPF uh, is curved. It represents uh, the opportunity cost uh, of uh, healthcare and education. <clears throat> That's just a quick uh, graphical way of looking at scarcity. Uh, when we talk about economic efficiency, as we will a lot in this, that has a very precise meaning. Economic efficiency 
is, exists one two ways. We have what we call allocative efficiency and productive efficiency. Productive efficiency simply means that all resources uh, in the economy are being used. Every single point along the PPF curve is productively efficient. Every single point is. Point B is productively efficient, point C is productively efficient, point D, point F, point A. All resources are being used. Allocative efficiency, on the other hand, is the point on the PPF where every where uh, the most amount of satisfaction for society is achieved. I have not given you enough information to be able to determine that. We will talk about that uh, in more detail in a future lecture. Um, I just wanted at this point to introduce those terms to plant the seed in the back of your head. <clears throat> now, the final part of this lecture deals with the economic way of thinking. The economic way of thinking is uh, what I've started to introduce to you today. It's a mode of thinking about the problems that we face as a society. Economics is a social science. Um, so let's start with a good example. Here we have a skating rink. This is uh, the Boston Gardens skating rink up in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, where I'm from. So a little hometown bias there. Uh, and imagine that this picture is in motion. What do you see? Well, you see a bunch of people skating around, some people watching. It's a nice day or a nice evening. What you don't see or what you would see very, very rarely it's people bumping into one another. It's not a mass chaos. Uh, there's not a free-for-all. And as a matter of fact, people all tend to sit, move in the same direction. And you don't really see anybody up above uh, directing all this. There's no man sitting with a mic microphone shouting, oh, number 27, speed up. Number 42, slow down. Uh, number 30, look out. Uh, everybody is out doing their own thing, and yet this order spontaneously emerges where very little accidents happen. And why is this? Well, part of it goes back to that discussion we had of mundane morality. These people, some of you know, they may know each other, some of them, groups of family or friends come here, but for the most part, they're all strangers. Why doesn't one stranger just bump into another stranger? Well, it's not out of love or compassion, although those uh, may play some small role, it's mostly out of this idea, well, if I bump into them, they're going to bump into me. I don't want to mess with their stuff because that will mean messing with my stuff and my uh, purpose, which is to skate around and have a fun time, uh, will get frustrated. So we start to see this development of this spontaneous order that comes out uh, of, of the marketplace, of just simple people interacting with one another. That's all that's going on here. And we're going to be looking at that, uh, or we're going to use this kind of um, method of exploring the spontaneous order that is the marketplace. The amazing thing about the marketplace is no one person directs it. It is of human action, but not human design. So let's talk about some of the ten or the ten pillars of this economic wisdom. Uh, ten pillars that we use to think about economic situations. These ten pillars come from David Henderson, and there's a link uh, underneath here uh, to his uh, original blog post where he talks about these, uh, as well as the book where he goes into great detail. So the ten pillars are first and foremost Tan Stoffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. If you want something, you have to give something up, or what economists call cost. That's what the PPF was. You uh, want some here, you have to give up some education. Second, incentives matter. People respond to incentives. Uh, part of the market process is structuring these incentives so that people end up doing things that are socially virtuous. 
Number three, economic thinking is thinking on the margin. You're going to hear that phrase a lot, on the margin, marginal cost, marginal benefit. What's the margin people are adjusting along? Margin simply means one more. What happens if we buy one more banana? What happens if we spend one more hour doing this? Things like that. Uh, in total, uh, there might be some outcome that you prefer, but on the margin, you might take different actions. On the whole, you might rather be spending time with your family or playing a video game than listen to, listening to my lecture. But on the margin, uh, the margin of how am I going to spend these 15 to 20 minutes, you're watching this video. Number four, the only way to create wealth is to move it from a lower valued use to a higher valued use. To move a resource from a lower value use to a higher value use. We're going to go into a lot more detail, but what basically this means is uh, if I value my car at $3,000, you value it at $5,000, you give me $5,000 for your car, that car is now more valuable or more uh, wealthy. We have created wealth. And when we talk about trade uh, in the next couple of lectures and exchange, that'll become a lot more obvious. Number five, information is valuable and costly. To get information about a product or an activity, you need to spend time to get it. You need to give something up. Um, a lot of our models will assume that people are perfectly informed. Those are simplifying assumptions. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, they're not going to undermine the model itself, but the fact that information is valuable and costly will depend a lot or will affect a lot how people um, behave, how they act, the kind of information that they get. Uh, this will become very important when we talk about public choice in a couple of weeks. Number six, every action has unintended consequences. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about these unintended consequences. Intentions are not in, in and of themselves results. We're going to look a lot at uh, what Frederick Bassiat called the unseen, especially in the next couple of weeks when we talk about price controls. There's a lot of what we're seeing right now with toilet paper shortages and paper towel shortages uh, coming from uh, this virus uh, are these unintended consequences of otherwise well-intentioned policy. The value, number seven, the value of a good or service is subjective, not objective. When we talk about the value of a good or service, I'm going to often ask you, well, according to whom? Who is the subject that, we're, that is evaluating? Uh, for example, the car that I just talked about. The value of the car is not tied to the car itself, but the person who is evaluating it, the person who is willing to pony up for the car. Um, this is true of costs as well. Costs are subjective. And in a couple of weeks, when we talk about um, costs in more detail, uh, that's going to become obvious. Speaking of costs, number eight, costs are a bad, not a good. We want to try and minimize costs in our decision making. Uh, as such, we will try to um, maximize our benefit. Number nine, the only way to increase a nation's real income is to increase its real output. This doesn't apply to us a whole lot. Uh, this is much more uh, of a macroeconomic factor, and we talk about that in my Principles of Macro class, so let's skip over that. But number 10 here, competition is a hardy weed, not a delicate flower. I'm going to be hammering the, home this point. This is a very, very, very important uh, point. People are amazingly creative. Uh, and will find ways to compete to overcome problems all the time and in ways that are unexpected. Uh, it takes a lot to destroy competition and the wealth that it can create. As Adam Smith wrote back in 1775, there is a lot of ruin in a nation. And there's a lot of ruin in competition, or, uh, in competition as well. It takes a lot to kill it. So this is the foundation of the uh, economic way of thinking, which we will be talking about uh, over the course of this semester. 
Uh, this concludes the first lecture. Uh, and look for new videos next week on Lecture 2, where we start going into the supply and demand models.